Hello and uh, welcome everyone. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce Jakub Tarnowski, who's a PhD candidate at uh, EPFL under the advice of Ola Svensson, who's also here. Uh, Jakub. Jakub has been uh, an intern with the Algorithms Group this summer, and I think he has a kind of very uh, rare uh, achievement of having won two best paper awards while he's still a student. I don't know. This is very uncommon, sure. And one of those is for the uh, result he's going to talk about today. It's, uh, I know this problem um, many is very popular. It's one of the, the biggest uh, open. It had been the biggest open problem in approximation algorithms for a long time to get uh, a constant factor uh, approximation algorithm for the asymmetric traveling salesman problem. Uh, so, over to Jakob to uh, tell us about this. Okay, thanks, Nikhil, for the introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> so, this is joint work with uh, Ula, who is here. As Nikhil said, we are at the EPFL, and uh, with Lars Lovek, who is at the London School of Economics, and uh, not in this room. Um, so, this work is inspired by the mother of all research questions, namely, what is the cheapest way to visit all the uh, 24,727 pubs in the UK, which is this, due to Cook et al. It's uh, 45,000 kilometers, give or take. It's actually not give or take, it's exactly, this is the optimum. Okay, um, so a bit more generally, uh, in the traveling assessment problem, we're given a, <coughs> a graph or n given cities with pairwise distances between them, we want to find the shortest tour of these cities. Maybe it looks like this. Okay. Um, so this is uh, this has been already studied in the 19th century uh, by Hamilton Kirkman. You probably know the term Hamiltonian path, um, and so it's a benchmark problem in computer science, uh, also in approximation algorithms. It's one of the most studied NPR optimization problems, but uh, somehow our understanding of it is quite incomplete. That shows in the approximation ratios, for example. Um, and we are interested in looking at it from a theoretical perspective, so from efficient algorithms, what can you accomplish with efficient computation, so approximation algorithms. Um, so there are two basic versions of the problem. There is the symmetric version where uh, the distances uh, are symmetric, so between any two pairs of vertices you have the same distance. And here it's, it's quite easy to get to approximation. And there's the celebrated 1.5 approximation by Christophides that is taught in undergrad. And uh, you know, it's from 76 and it still has not been beaten. Um, so this is a huge open problem to beat this. But we are interested in the asymmetric version uh, where distances are not symmetric. So you know, maybe you have this Mont Blanc here, it's, it's quite tough to get up. If you believe the picture, it's easy to, to fly down from it, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Very good. So this is this is our setting. So formally, we're given an edge weighted digraph, and we want a minimum weight tour that visits each vertex at least once. So we have maybe weights on edges, um, some weights. You can see they are not very symmetric, um, and this is some example tour. You can notice that it visits some vertices more than once. Um, equivalently, there is another formulation where we say, okay. I uh, want to visit each vertex exactly once. Then to get an approximation, we need to assume that it's a complete graph with the triangle inequality. Uh, but we like uh, the version of at least better. Um, OK. So another formulation is that uh, we are wanting to find a connected Eulerian multigraph. OK. So here, Eulerian means it's a directed graph. So the ver for each vertex, the in degree should be equal to the out degree. and um, yeah, so this is a nice formulation, for example, because it uh, brings us to the standard LP relaxation. It's called the held carp relaxation. Uh, so, so that has a variable x u v for a number of times that we traverse the edge from u to v. Uh, I want to minimize the weighted sum subject to these two constraints. First of all, this should be a Eulerian. So this notation means that the in degree is equal to the out degree, roughly. Um, and second, uh, 
this is the connected constraint, so these are called the subtural elimination constraints for every set of vertices. Uh, like this, for example, this is not a good tour because it's not connected and it's, it would violate for this set the constraint that we want to have at least one flow out and one flow, uh, one unit of flow in. Uh, and actually, usually this is written as that the outflow should be at least one or the inflow. Uh, we take the sum of inflow and outflow. So this delta of S is just the set of cut, the cut edges in either direction. <coughs> Uh, it's, it's of course the same, but it makes it a little bit more elegant to talk about it because it's more symmetric that way. Okay, so this is del p. Uh, and we are also interested in knowing, besides the approximation ratio, also how far is this particular algorithm where you solve del p just return that number, how far off is that. Um, <clears throat> so now in, in the ATSP there is this kind of combination of harness of three things that you want to find an Eulerian connected multigraph and your solution should be integral, okay? If you pick any two, then this is in P. For example, it's in P to solve the health curve relaxation where we relax the integrality. Uh, it's in P to, you know, if you're, this shouldn't be connected, then you want to find the cycle cover. Or if you don't need to be Eulerian, then you can find the spanning tree. All these problems are easy, uh, but it is P and P hard. Um, so, in terms of approximation algorithms, there are two natural strat <coughs> strategies. So we want to find the minimum weight connected to Eulerian multigraph. So, you know, we can begin with relaxing one of these two things. So maybe we find the first the spanning tree, or maybe we find a cycle cover or some other Eulerian, uh, sorry, connected but not Eulerian multigraph, and start from that. Okay. So there are these two lines of thought. Um, and so the, uh, the first notable approximation algorithm is the Logan approximation by Fries, Galbiat, and Maffioli. It's a very nice algorithm that I will show you later, and that is uh, obtained by basically repeatedly solving a cycle cover problem. Okay? Um, and this, people tried to push this approach, and in 21 uh, years they couldn't do it, and then when they could do it, it was uh, an improvement in the constant. So Blazer got a 0 0.99 Logan. This is not O of log n, it's exactly log n. And then uh, the current world record in pushing this is due to Feig and Singh, it's two thirds log n, okay? Um, good. So in this other line of research, there is the very influential work of uh, Asad Purgemas, Mondrio Vizgal and Saberi in 2010, who, make, who made the first asymptotic improvement of the approximation ratio. And so they can shave off a log log n factor. It's log n over log log n. And they do it by, <coughs> uh, by pointing out the relationship uh, between this and the so-called thin tree uh, problem. Um, so they basically find a spanning tree and uh, by sampling it from some distribution and then try to say that, okay, now patching this up to be uh, Eulerian should be not too expensive. Um, then using um, this approach, uh, Ovisgan and Saberi could get a constant factor for planar graphs and more generally for bounded genus graphs. And then in another very nice work, uh, the <coughs> anariant of Ovisgaran showed that the integrality gap is bounded by poly log log n. So this is not constructive, so they don't have an algorithm with this ratio uh, because this proceeds via generalization of the Marcus Spielmann Srivastava solution to the Cadison Singer problem. Um, and this, this thin trees and <clears throat> I'm looking at effective resistances in the graph. Okay, um, in terms of harness, um, numbers are quite different. So for example, we know that it's NP hard approximated is PUV in a factor of, well, essentially one plus epsilon. Um, and the integrality gap is at least two, okay? Um, so there is this huge gap in the integrality gap, you know, between a low constant and a non-constant, and uh, even bigger gap in the approximation ratios that, that we could get, okay? Um, so then there is this third approach introduced by Ulla Svensson, um, who in 2015 defined a new easier problem called local connectivity ATSP. Uh, he showed that if you can get, uh, if you can solve that problem, then you can get a constant factor for the ATSP. And uh, then it turns out that it's possible and in fact not too hard to solve that easier problem for unweighted graphs. So that way he gets a constant factor for unweighted graphs. Okay. So 
Um, so this was a new approach, right? And uh, you know, in particular, if you see this structure where it's there's this new thing which is now easy to do for unweighted graphs, and previously nobody could do it for even for those graphs, you know, think, okay, so can you do it for uh, for some larger class of, of graphs, right? Or can you just solve it for general graphs? Um, so we worked on this and. Uh, in 2016, we could solve it for a slightly larger class, namely uh, graphs that have uh, two different weights on the edges. Okay. Maybe very, very different edge weights, maybe 0 and 1, for example. Um, okay, so that was the situation before this work. Uh, and now we can give a constant factor approximation for general ATSP, and this is with respect to the health car relaxation. Okay, so um, somehow, what is the difference between this thing that we do now and the previous approach for these two edge weights is that for two edge weights, we just used uh, uh, ULA's reduction directly. Uh, and so if you use it, then you have to solve local connectivity ATSP, which is this easier problem on graphs that have two edge weights. So this we could do, although it was quite complicated. So then um, a natural thing is to use this reduction, which you can do for any class of graphs. and and now you're, uh, you're, uh, you're faced with the task of solving this on general ITSP, and this we could not do. Uh, in fact, we couldn't even generalize our methods to graphs that have three edge weights. Um, so in, in fact, we take a different approach. We stay in the realm of ATSP for some time, okay? But we proceed, vi proceed via a series of reductions to more structured instances, okay? We get these more structured instances, and yet more structured instances. So we have this series of reductions that I will show you. And then once we get something that's really, really structured, that we will call vertebrate pairs, then we use the reduction. And now this is something that we can actually solve using uh, some combination of prior approach and, and some new stuff. Okay. So this is the map of our, uh, of our result. I will more or less show you uh, show, show you uh, this so a short tour of of this part. Okay, so um, so we have these few reductions. Uh, so there are some uh, nice names that should not mean anything to you just yet, but maybe in an hour they will. Um, so we proceed by this series of reductions, and they are quite modular. Okay, so. There is this goldfish sometimes on the slide. If there is a goldfish, that means you should remember this slide, but the other slides you can easily just forget. Uh, okay, so, so you can just, uh, you know, there are just some things that you re need to remember between these reductions, but as I will talk about each one, then there will be some, uh, something to remember. Okay, uh, so let's begin with this first one which is a reduction to something that we call laminarly weighted instances, which is uh, not a valid word for Scrabble. Um, it's laminar, I guess. So. Laminar, yes, yes, of course. But laminarly, they, yeah. Mm. yeah, so they look like this. Um, so if there is, a net, there is some family of sets, and each edge gets its weight from this family of sets in a way that I will explain to you. Um, and this proceeds by LP duality, basically. So let's see how. So there was this uh, health car relaxation. Mm, let's recall this. Okay, so this is the LP. Um, so, well, if we have an LP, then a good starting point for an algorithm is, well, to solve the LP. Okay. We solve it. And obtain the solution depicted in black. So, so far we have these blue edges, uh, they are weights. Now we have this LP solution. The LP value is 22 if you care to uh, compute it. Um, okay, so we are quite lucky it's integral. But in general it won't be integral, but I will still show you on an integral example. Um, the first thing is that, well, some edges are, are pretty bad, like this has weight 100 and, and the same LP solution does not use this. Um, so we can actually forget those edges. Of course, it does not change the LP value, and we will just build a tour on the subgraph that has non-zero LP value. Um, so they are gone. Very good. And now all the edges have positive LP value, which will actually be helpful. And 
Mm, I'm actually going to duplicate the sum edges a little bit so that now everything has just LP value one. Okay, so the black stuff is gone. Good, so um, do these edges have some structure? Like what happens in an LP if, uh, if I have something that is, uh, that is strictly positive? Well, there is this complementarity slackness business, okay? So each remaining edge corresponds to the tight constraint in the dual. So unfortunately, we have to write the dual, but bear with me. Um, right, so the dual has the following stuff. Let me just explain. So <clears throat> it has variables uh, alpha v, so for each vertex I have alpha v, which is a vertex potential, and it has a ys, which is non-negative. This is some value for each cut s in the graph. Okay. Um, and the constraints are that for each edge, the sum of the y values on the sets that, uh, uh, that uh, cut this edge plus the tail potential minus the head potential of this edge is at most the edge weight. So let's see some examples. So, Mm, okay, this red stuff is the y values, so the dual values over the sets. So this is a set, it has dual value 2, for example. And these uh, blue things written in the vertices are the alphas, the vertex potentials. Okay, so let's look at some examples for this uh, constraint. Oh yeah, the dual value is of course equal to the LP, it's 22. Okay, so for this edge, okay. Uh, well, let's try to write it out. So um, this is... Let's look at the sets that this edge crosses. It's the, the sum is four of the y values, uh, and we have plus three minus uh, six. Okay, so this should be at most one, which is the weight. Indeed, it is. It's actually equal. What a coincidence. <laughs> okay, um, another one. So this uh, exits two sets. It doesn't matter if it exits or enters because it's kind of symmetric that way. Uh, so we have 1 plus 2 uh, plus 4 minus 6, uh, okay, 1. All right, good. So this is how the constraints look like. And by complementary slackness, they're actually satisfied with equality because we throw away all the, um, all the zero edges. Okay, so we have this mm, for every edge. The weight is given actually by this dual solution. Now let me write this a little bit. I move the alphas to the other side. Mm -hmm. Okay, magic. Now uh, let me actually call this right hand side W prime of UV because this is going to be a new weight function. So I'm going to change the weight function by essentially applying these potentials that the LP gave us. Okay, so if I do it then an observation is that for n earlier and each set, each set uh, actually the weight has not changed. So I, I could just as well use this new function. And this should not be too hard to see. For example, if I have a cycle ABC, then my weight of this is just, you know, you get plus alpha minus uh, A minus uh, al uh, alpha B, and then plus B minus C plus C minus A, you know, it's, it's cycles Eulerian, so it cancels out. So we can apply a potential this way, um, that's fun. So now we have this new weight function where, uh, where indeed the weight of an edge is just the sum of the y values of the dual sets that it crosses. Okay, so now we can remove these potentials. There's some new weights. Okay, good, so then this is a simpler setting. So what happened is that we had something complicated and then we dropped the zero edges, we brought the complementary slackness, and we normalized using these vertex potentials from a dual now. Uh, now, uh, basically, we have a lot of structure. Okay, good. We want more structure, of course. Um, so, you know, complementary slackness goes both ways. We have already used the primal complementary slackness, or maybe the dual. I don't know which is which. Uh, but now we can use the other one. Um, so let's uh, call L uh, the support of the dual solution. So the set family that has uh, non-zero uh, dual values, basically these red sets are L, okay? Uh, again, you see this, this corresponds to this. So for any set that actually has a non-zero value, it's going to be a tight set in the sense that uh, 
x, uh, you know, the flow over this set in both ways is exactly 2. This is something that LP tells us to visit this set exactly once, if, if we could. Okay, so this is tight. Uh, even better now, uh, we can do uncrossing on this dual uh, family. And, um, and then we get that we can have an L that is laminar. Okay, the laminar family is something like this, where you don't have this situation where you have two sets intersecting non-trivially. Okay, so laminar family. So now this brings us, uh, when we apply all this, we, we get this notion of a laminarly weighted instance. So this is an instance where weights are, you know, not given by an instance, but uh, they are induced from these dual things, okay? So there's no weight function in, in this tuple, but instead the tuple contains a primal and a dual solution. Uh, the graph and a laminar family of tight sets, so a, a family like, like in the picture, and they are tight. Okay, so these, these are the sets that you kind of should visit once. Um, right, so, so each of them, like for example, this set S has one flow outgoing, one incoming. And the weights are induced by this L and this Y. Okay, so the weight of any edge is the sum of the dual values of the sets that crosses. For example, this edge has 2 plus 5, then plus 1. This edge has 1 plus 3 plus 2 plus 5. Okay. Interestingly, if I have an edge also in the other direction, it has the same weight. Of course, they there might not be such an edge because it's no longer a complete graph, even if it was in the beginning, but still uh, we have this slight symmetricity. You can think that the asymmetricity now comes from the graph, but like no longer from the weights. Okay, and so we have already proved the theorem. Very good. A uh, real approximation algorithm, if you could give one for these laminarly weighted instances, will give uh, will yield you a real approximation for general ITSP. Good. Uh, okay, one more thing. So the dual value was two times the uh, the sum of all these dual values. In the example, it's well 28. Okay, so two times the sum of the y's. Okay, so what you should remember is that we have reduced our task to, to something that looks like this. Um, so again, you have primal and dual solutions. You have this laminar family of tight sets, and the weights are induced in this way. OK, any questions so far? No. Okay. So now we will reduce it to irreducible instances. I mean, that's obvious, right? You reduce until you can't. Then it's irreducible. Um, so indeed, we. Um, we say that, okay, we can actually recurse and solve smaller instances recursively. That is not too dangerous. If, if we recurse, the optimum drops, okay? So I will make this clear in some example in a minute. Uh, but then if the optimum does not drop, then we will have long paths. Okay. So let's take a detour at this point. And I will explain to you why, uh, like why this um, recursive approach would be fine if the uh, optimum dropped. Okay, and now I will show you to do it. I will show you this uh, algorithm by Fries, Galbiat, and Mafioli from IT. It proceeds as follows: first, we find the minimum cost cycle cover in the graph. So, can we guess from the shape what the cycle cover might be? Very good. Okay, this is the mean cost cycle cover. Now, um, we contract the graph. Uh, oh, wait. So we pay that most opt because opt, the, the optimum tour, is some cycle cover. So we pay opt. Now we contract. And by contract, I mean that we take one, we select one representative vertex, any vertex from each cycle, and we build a new graph on that by inducing. OK, so that happens. Now we recurse. OK, so we repeat. Now this the new cycle cover. Again, from opt, you can t get such a cycle cover. So again, we pay at most opt. And then again, we pay opt three times opt. OK. The worst case is that if all the cycles would have length two. In that case, we have to repeat this thing log n times. Each time, it costs us uh, opt. And you, know, you get a log n approximation, uh, which is great, but not a constant. And so um, this seems a bit pessimistic, right? Every time we pay opt, even now that our graph has two vertices. 
Maybe this never happens, actually. It's not ever so bad. Um, so notice that this would be fine if the value would actually drop. So let's, you know, we make some progress. Um, let's assume that whenever we do it, the value of opt drops by a factor 9 over 10. Well, then we get this nice uh, decreasing geometric uh, sum. Uh, and if that happened, we would get a 10 approximation. OK, awesome. Um, however, uh, this kind of doesn't work. Indeed, that algorithm is exactly a log n approximation. Uh, people have tried to pursue this strategy, but no one got a constant. Um, so we do something else. We pursue it using our laminarly weighted structure. OK, now Larry too. Uh, pardon my French. Uh, so recall this. OK, so we had this. <coughs> laminar structure where there's a laminar family of tight sets. The weights are induced by uh, this uh, family um, and these dual values in this way. Okay. Good. Um, so let's look at how we contract things. Mm. So we have a tight set. Um, so let's look at this tight set and these are its boundary edges. If you wanted to contract it, then the situation would look like this. Okay. So it is shrunk into one vertex. And in a graph theoretic sense, it's clear what it means to contract a set of vertices into, into a vertex. The, the edges are mapped somehow. Um, the only thing that's not clear in our setting uh, is uh, what you would set the new dual value to be. Okay, So bear with me. I will motivate how to set it. Um, yeah. All right. Um, or if, you know, this is an example where we contracted this set. OK, we have to specify the y value. Good. Um, so why are we doing all this? Well, the main idea is the following. We are going to contract this, then solve ATSP recursively in uh, this instance on the right, which is smaller, and then come back and patch it up somehow. OK, so let's say that this is our tour on the right. Now we would like to lift it. Okay. So let's just copy the edges for now. OK. So we trace this here. OK. So we traced it. Oops. Now there is a hole in the middle, right? This is not Eulerian even. Not connected, but, but even not Eulerian. Well, what to do? We can simply add the shortest path from this to this. OK. Let's add it. Good. Now we can proceed. So we will go here. OK, again, there's a hole, and we patch it up. <clears throat> Good. Um, so this dual value, essentially, we are going to set so that we can always pay for this rewiring, for, for adding this path. OK, so um, indeed, we set it to, like, there's this problem that if you have a tour that goes here and goes here, right, you don't know where this entry maps to in here. So we actually take the maximum of all the possible ways to enter and exit this set. Okay, So let's say that this is the worst possible pair of vertices to enter and exit. Between them, the shortest path is kind of long. Um, so then we would set this to be 17. And that's pretty bad because this path crosses every, every tight set in the middle. Um, although. It is at least the worst case. Okay, so no matter how we enter and exit, there will be a path that uh, enters and exits each set at most once. Okay, so at least when we do this, when we take this maximum, that this contraction operation does not increase the LP value. Then it feels like uh, we would be in real trouble. Okay, good. So let's see. In this example, we pay 17 on the right every time we enter, but here. You know, this time we pay like 2 plus 2 plus 3. And then this time we pay, oh, what, 5, 1, 4. OK. So every time that we lift, because of the way we set it to be pessimistic, we pay not more than this thing on the right would cost. OK. So the change of cost is always uh, non-positive. So but by, by this design, the lift is not more expensive than the tour in the contracted instance. OK. Any questions? 
Good. So let's gather the facts that we have about this contraction business. Uh, the contraction has not increased the LP value, and the lift is not more expensive than the tour in the contract instance. So, so are we done? Well, we are not quite done because uh, the lift is a subtour, but maybe it's not a tour. Okay, so as you can see here, there are some vertices that we, uh, we have not visited. We have visited uh, everything outside because this visit it, visits everything outside, but, uh, but maybe it's, it's not true. We call such a thing a sub -tour. Okay, so now the crucial point is that if this contraction actually, instead of just not increasing the LP value, actually causes a significant decrease to the LP value, then we will be able to use this remaining budget to complete this lift by connecting up these vertices into a tour. So let's see how this is done. Uh, so for this we need a definition. We're going to define a set S to be reducible, which is our language for nice. Uh, if the worst way to enter and exit, cross at most, uh, let's say, a three-fourth fraction of the sets inside S. <coughs> So the total value inside S here is 2 plus 1 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2, that's 12. So the, if this should be contractible, then the worst way to enter and exit should cross sets that have value at most 9. Let's say this is the worst case. Then that's really bad. The, it's, it's 12, actually, it cross every tight set. This is the worst case, actually, and this is not reducible, not, not a nice set for us. Um, however, if that is the worst case, this pair of vertices, then it's 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 4, it's 9. Okay, just barely made it, it's, it's reducible. Okay. Um, and we'll say that instance is irreducible if we don't have any nice set on which to do something. Then an instance is irreducible. Um, and we can prove that if, if we're given a row approximation algorithm for irreducible instances, then we would get an eight row approximation algorithm for laminarly weighted instance, and thus we get it for general ITSP. Okay, so we lose a factor eight by, by essentially being able to assume that this is not, we have an irreducible instance. Okay, so let's see how to get this. So let A be our black box approximation algorithm uh, with a factor row. Okay, so how can we solve reducible instances if we have that black box for irreducible instances? So, well, the first step, if the instance is irreducible, then we run our black box, we get a, we get a row approximation that, of course, we could have eight rows, so that's fine. Okay, otherwise there is some reducible set and we choose a minimal reducible set, okay? So all these sets in here are irreducible, in fact, okay? We choose this and we contract it. That was the plan all along. And you see this, this used to have value uh, 17. Uh, the sum of these things was 17, now it's 14. So there is some uh, drop in LP value, namely three. Okay, so now we recursively find the tour here. How costly is that? Well, we are recursively, inductively, somehow building an a true approximation, okay? So this is an a true approximation on this instance. And the value of this instance is opt minus our drop that used to be three. Okay, it is three. So more formally, it's at least one fourth times the LP value inside this thing. Okay, so the sum of the y, r, four sets r that are here. Um, so when, you, when we write it out, we get that we should pay at most a true opt. Uh, sorry, that we have already paid eight row opt minus we have this budget of two row times the, the kind of the value of stuff inside here. So that's, that's a budget that we can now use to patch things up. Um, okay, so there's this lift. As we said, the lift is no more expensive because of the way that we said that's number 14. Good, and now the remaining task is to connect this vertex and this vertex and this vertex to a tour uh, while paying at most this. If we can pay at most this, then we will pay in total eight row times opt, and that we will have uh, inductively constructed our eight row approximation. Okay, so this is the task. We have to pay at most this much. So we only need to connect unvisited vertices inside this. 
Um, so for this talk, let me uh, simplify things a bit by assuming that once we restrict ourselves to the vertices inside S, this is a feasible instance. Okay, so scratch all, all that. Uh, now we have all, only this, these guys inside, and this, let's say that this is feasible for LP. Okay, so this is an irreducible instance now, because you remember we chose a minimal reducible set, and, and everything inside is not reducible. Um, and that means essentially that we can run our algorithm, the black box algorithm on this, right? Uh, so the health care value of this instance is two times the dual values, which is basically what appeared in our budget, okay? So now we can solve this instance using our black box and get a tour of weight at most row times, times this. Okay, uh, maybe this tour looks like this. And we have paid, uh, well, we're even better by a factor of two than we needed to be. Awesome. Now, um, so now what's the whole picture? We contract to recursively find the lift of weight at most this. This is the budget that we saved, and this is that lift. And then we can find the tour on S of weight at most rho times, times uh, this expression. We add it, now it's a tour, okay? And we have paid at most this, which is, you know, even better than we wanted. Now, um, if the simplifying assumption is not true, which it isn't, uh, then we, we do something a bit more complicated, and so we lose this factor 2 here. So now we have this times 2, and, and we lose this thing, but that's okay. That's the way it was designed to be. So we get 8 rho times soft. Okay. Okay, so the goldfish, so, uh, so what we have proved is that if we have a approximation for irreducible instances, and now we, uh, now we can have an H approximation on every instance. Good. <clears throat> so now let me just uh, sketch for you uh, how to deal with irreducible instances, and here we get something that we call vertebrate pairs. That's a vertebrate. Um, <laughs> So uh, the basic, sorry? It's a pair. <laughs> pair, uh, because, okay, there will be an instance and there will be its skeleton, kind of. <laughs> a bit mathy, okay. Um, so the basic idea is that irreducible instances are now already a bit close to node-weighted instances in that we can solve them using similar tools. Mm. Okay, let's make some simplifying assumptions again for the talk. Let's say that my family L contains all singletons, you know, that each vertex has actually one of these small sets. It has a node weight which is strictly positive, and that <coughs> now is the big simplifying assumption that the instance is actually perfectly irreducible. Okay, so if I contract any set, not only do I not get a big uh, decrease in LP value, actually I don't, I don't get any. Okay, no decrease in LP value by contracting anything. Okay. So, look, when I contract a set, the LP decrease is basically proportional to the weighted fraction of the sets that are not crossed by this worst case shortest path. Okay? So, if there is no LP decrease, a decrease in LP value when I contract, that means that this path always crosses everything. Okay? So, we have this all the singletons, no LP decrease. Then the only way that this can happen is that the worst way to enter an exit must, must visit everything. So maybe for this big set, it's like this, okay? There is some worst case per vertices such that the shortest path between them visits everything. So kind of clearly, this is good for solving ATSP. Like, I can efficiently, because they are shortest paths, find some paths that, like, visit everything, okay? Um, so now comes the algorithm for this situation. So we first, we have this setting. We have all of this is irreducible. We contract them. Okay, now this is uh, some instance that's actually node weighted. Uh, node weighted means that you know the the weight of any edge only is a sum of the weights of its endpoints. Um, and this is something that already we can solve uh, by Ula's results. So we can get a 28 approximation on this. Maybe this is our brilliant tour of this instance. And now we lift it. 
but we'll lift it a, in a bit weird way. Okay, so let's start lifting. So we are uh, following this path now. So this maps maybe to these vertices. Now, what I would do normally is I would sell, uh, insert a shortest path from this to this. Okay. Instead, I'm going to locate these two worst case vertices in this irreducible set and first go to this guy, then do this walk, the shortest path between them, and now I will visit everything. And then I, I patch up by returning to where I want it to be. Okay. So I continue lifting. So now I go here and here. So this is this. Now we have to patch this up. Okay, so there are some two vertices. I go to this. Now I take this tour that it's everything. Now I go where I want to be. And again, I do the same thing here. Something that fills everything. Okay. And good. Now this is a, this is a, this is a tour. Okay. Everything is visited. The cost of this tour is what? Well, we, we did this lift and we, uh, we also added these paths. So the lift is at most 28 times opt because, well, of how we design things. Uh, and also we add these three shortest paths, right? Because I went, for example, here, then I did this work and then I went here. And the cost of each path it can be bounded by the LP value inside that set. Uh, and so I get three times opt. So overall it's 31 times opt. We'll get our constant. Okay, so in total we'll get 30, 31 times 8 if we get this perfect irreducibility. Okay, so again there are simplifying assumptions that are not quite true. Um, so the worst uh, way to enter and exit any set in, in it only crosses most sets as opposed to all the sets in L. Okay, uh, we still do that reduction except we walk away not with a tour but just with some uh, something of cost 31 times opt that is kind of a good basis backbone for, for uh, connecting everything. Um, so we call this sub to uh, be a, a backbone. Uh, so now there is this vertebrate terminology. That's the backbone. Uh, and essentially it has the properties that it's cheap and it crosses all the non-singleton sets of L. So now look, in each set, uh, you know, all the, there is something already. Uh, in each, inside each set, you just want to connect these unvisited singletons to the path. Maybe it's easier than general ITSP, right? Indeed, it's, it looks like it should be easier. And this we can do. Uh, so this, now we use this reduction to local connectivity ITSP and uh, we find some circulations. Um, so for this, there is a talk uh, by Laszlo on YouTube where he goes into more detail on this part. But I'm out of time, I guess. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, we get a constant fact approximation and it with respect to healthcare prolaxation. Um, and we had this sequence of reductions uh, that make the paper modular. Um, so first we use this uh, power of LP duality. Uh, then we had this recursive approach that worked as long as opt drops and, and then it got stuck. And once it got stuck, we used the stuckness to uh, to say that, okay, we can get this backbone and then this behaves like a node-weighted instance. And finally, we use circulations and this reduction to local connectivity ASP to, uh, to finish. Okay, so some open questions are, you know, uh, I have been tacitly avoiding the, the topic of constant. Uh, so it's like 5,000, <laughs> um, could be better. Uh, people seem to believe, uh, although, other people have been asked me who those people are, and I don't know, but I think some people believe that the right ratio should be two, um, or anyway, not 5,000. And uh, we can optimize our approach a bit, make it less modular, open up some black boxes, and then we could maybe get an upper bound in the hundreds, but really new ideas are needed to get anywhere close to two or the whereabouts. Um, there is another problem called bottleneck ATSP. So here you are given a graph and you want to find the tour the, with the, that minimizes not the sum of the edges that you took, but the max weight. Okay. Uh, so in the symmetric case, this problem is solved in that it's hard to get two and, and they get two. Okay. So it, it, there's a factor of two, it's tight. 
Uh, and here we don't know. Like uh, there's log n over log log n approximation, and probably probably one can get a constant. And well, there is this three thin three conjecture which would also solve ATSP uh, in the sense of obtaining a constant. So you would get this if you can prove or find a tree such that for any cut in the graph, it cross the tree crosses that cut with at most constant uh, times more edges than the LP solution crosses that cut. Um, so well, first of all, if you got that, you would get another constant factor for ATSP. Uh, moreover, uh, our work does not imply anything for bottleneck ATSP, but this thin tree conjecture would solve it. This uh, reduction by uh, Anne Kleiberg and Schmoyce, which indeed gives this log n over log log n. Um, so the question is, okay, either solve this or maybe actually bottleneck is, is easier because thin tree implies this. So can you solve this? Okay, thank you. Questions? Yeah. Uh, so this is the algorithm for which you can prove it gives you a constant. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, any conjecture about some easy algorithm that should also give a constant, but you're not, not able to prove it right now? Mm. There is something. There was something. I don't remember what the algorithm was, but there was something related to max entropy, where you first find a max entropy solution to health curve and then do something. I don't remember. No, but at the time I would say. Related to that, I'm like less familiar with heuristics that seem to work well for ATSP. Uh -huh. uh, are there some heuristics for which you think, like on most nice instances, you would be able to show some kind of constant factor? Is mm. that... You're asking, can we show a constant for some heuristic on some classes? Some nicer classes, yeah. Like the, related to this question of like algorithms that one uh -huh. might see working well in practice. I don't know this for ATSP. At all, so. Yeah, I'm not sure either, but you know, even for node weighted, it was open until 2015 yeah, 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 to yeah. get uh, to get a constant, and it seems that maybe for node weighted, actually heuristics would work well. But then I'm just guessing here. We're not so much practitioners. <laughs> Thanks.